Well, maybe we, we can start. Yes. Yes, sure. So, so please, this is the talk by Vladimir Chernov. And the title of the talk is Application of Linking to the Study of Causality. Please go ahead. So it is my pleasure to give this talk in this uh, in virtual regime. And I hope to visit you, Ukraine sometime soon, but I did that probably not this year uh, because of pandemic. Uh, so uh, what are, so, well, well, so first of all, what is the main result? The main result, even if you're not a mathematician, is, is very easy to understand. The main result is the following. Assume that you are the creator of the universe, And you would like to create a universe which looks today on uh, my on may 28 2021 exactly the same way as ours but you would like uh two events that were previously caused one was causing the other the event number one was causing the event number two you would like to do it the other way around you would like to second event to create the event number one or you would like them to be unrelated Will you succeed or not? So clearly, every philosopher will say that it is impossible because there should be some preservation of causal structure. And basically, with Stefan Mirovsky, we proved that this is indeed the case. This is impossible. But since this is a theorem in mathematics as opposed to in philosophy, the conditions uh, for this is that the universal cover of the spatial component of your space time should not be as three. So the universal cover of the spatial component of space-time should not be S3. It's not S3. Or if you believe into the creation of universes of high dimensions, uh, likely it has to be not the same as uh, a sphere of high dimensions. Right? I mean, that in principle, you can think about the universes of high dimensions. This would probably be not very physical. Or a CPM, or the Octavians, or Hamiltonians. Projective. The high dimensions, we do not quite have this theorem because of the following that uh, basically what we have proved is that uh, this would be impossible provided that uh, the um, uh, homology ring of the universal cover of the spatial component is not having the same homology as one of these spaces. So there is a natural question, are there simply connected uh, manifolds of high dimensions uh, that have the same homology as the spaces, but are not these spaces? And the answer is two ways. If you talk about exotic smooth structures, of course, there are exotic smooth structures on S5 and S7 and so on. And in this sense, it is possible to have manifolds which have the same uh, homology is these spaces, but are not one of these spaces. But if you talk about the C0 topology, so continuous homeomorphisms, then nobody knows if this is possible or not. So chances are that even in high dimensions, the only way to create a universe where you can change the causal structure in the past, even if you have infinite abilities, is to create it from the very beginning so that the spatial component is a sphere, a projective space of one of these types, and that's it. Otherwise, you restrict your own freedom. So if you want, you can think about it as some sort of a, a causal structure preservation law. But information is completely determined by how the universe looks like right now. And let me uh, try to be more mathematical now. So what is the space time in the first place? So I will, from the very beginning, discuss space times of dimension m plus 1. So one for the time dimension and M for the spatial dimensions. And by the Einstein principle of general relativity, you cannot separate 
uh, time from space in any canonical way. And what we will assume basically is that this is a Lorentz manifold. What is Lorentz manifold? Uh, it means that it's very similar spiritually uh, to Riemann manifolds. But for Riemann manifolds, the Riemannian metric is positive definite and not degenerate and symmetric. And for Lorentz manifolds, the metric restricted to each tangent space looks like a sum of m positive squares. Then you suddenly have a minus, and then you have minus dt squared. So this splitting is not canonical, right? I mean, that exists also only in one individual tangent space. And the technique uh, to prove the main uh, sort of creativity result of today is actually quantum geometry, which is a little bit strange, right? Because how does quantum geometry relate to space time? So, on the first glance, it is not clear, but it completely determines the reality. And let us uh, try to be uh, more formal. So, what is a uh, causal vector? So causal vector V means that V dot V is less or equal than zero. But the vector itself is not the zero vector. And uh, it means that you are traveling with less or equal than light speed. So if V dot V is equal to zero, then this means light speed. So you have a light ray, so to say. And uh, Lorentz manifolds in many aspects are similar to Riemann manifolds. So there is notion of a geodesic. And uh, there are light geodesics where we have the velocity vector with itself dotted equal to zero. So uh, what is the main technical result we are going to use? So there is a uh, assumption that our space time satisfies the following two conditions, no time travel. You know that if you allow time travel, then there is this cruel thing you can do. You can go to the past and prevent your great grandfather from meeting your great grandmother. So if you succeed, then you should not exist and you will never succeed to do it because you don't exist. But if you don't exist, there is a natural question why you didn't exist. Why, why you didn't succeed. And probably the answer is that they don't care about your opinion because they're old fashioned and adults and you're just young. Uh, but nevertheless, we prohibit time travel to avoid these paradoxes. And uh, the second condition I would like to impose is that the intersection of the causal future and of the causal past of any two points is compact. So let me explain briefly what is causal future and what is causal past. So causal future is the set of all points that you can reach starting from the point P going into the future with less or equal than light speed. So since by Einstein's principle of general relativity, you cannot move faster than light speed, this means that you can reach it at all, right? Because you cannot exceed the speed of light. And this is causal past. So this is the set of all points from which you can get to Q going uh, to the future with less or equal than light speed. So the requirement is that the set is compact. So this is known as absence of naked singularities. So this is the name. So if you ever see the words absence of things that no naked singularities are present, this means exactly that these causal, so to say, diamonds are compact. 
angular layer right here. Let me give a canonical example of a space time. The canonical example is Minkowski space time. So topologically, it is just Rm plus one. And the metric is exactly the one I described. So it is dx1 squared plus, plus, plus dxm squared minus dt squared. And what is the intersection of this causal fusion causal path? So this is the point P. And this is, I'm sorry, let, let us change my assumption. So this is the point Q. And this is the point P. So the causal future of the point P is what sits inside of the future light column of the point P. The intersection of the causal path to the point Q is the reverse time column. The intersection is this guy. And of course, it is compact. So in the first glance, it is not even clear whether uh, this is ever not compact. And then, of course, it can be not compact because you can take scissors and you delete one point from the universe. So if you do that, then the causal diamond is not compact and that's it. But what will happen is that you will have trajectories going with less or equal than light speed that end at the deleted point. And then there will be a very bad situation because if you're an observer sitting at the point Q, then information traveling with less or equal than light speed can reach you. And from all the points of the trajectory, this information will reach you as an observer. But then suddenly your particle disappears. So this has never been observed. So the Penrose uh, conjecture, which is called strong cosmic censorship, says that it doesn't happen at all in any reasonable universe. So Penrose strong cosmic censorship conjecture. So let me immediately make a small amendment. Uh, can the particles disappear from your observable reality? Well, of course they can. I will take pink chalk, right? I mean, but, you know, the advantage of computers is that they can take as many colors of chalk as I want, because there are trajectories which disappear for natural reasons. They cross the boundary of this causal diamond. But if this happens, then at this moment, there is the joint light ray connecting the point Q and the moving particle. And the light ray is exactly when you see the particle with your eyes, right? Because you're on the Kerman light ray, so you see the light starting from this point and ending in your eyes, so you see the particle disappearing. But in the previous example, the particle disappeared without you seeing the process of disappearing. So this is a naked singularity and they do not exist. So what does it mean that they don't exist? They do exist inside of black holes, similar to time travel. Time travel exists in the car black holes, and it is unavoidable. So if you want to visit your great grandfather uh, who is long died, then you should go to the car black hole. But the trouble is that you will never be able to return back. So you will never be able to tell your friends that you actually managed to do it. Uh, so the real assumption of Penrose is that if you cut out the horizons of the black holes, which are the imaginary surfaces such that if you fall through them, you cannot return, and then the remaining uh, space time satisfies conditions one and two. And uh, space time satisfying conditions one and two are called globally hyperbolic. So this is the name. It has nothing to do with the metric of negative sectional curvature. So global hyperbolic space time is just two assumptions. No time travel and particles do not disappear. So what else should I say? In the first example, in the uh, picture with the naked singularity, it seems that your uh, space time is not geodesically complete. It is not indeed. But the only physically relevant geodesics are uh, uh, time-like geodesics, which means that you travel with the speed of less than the speed of light. This is called free fall. 
and light geodesic specialized rates. And what you can do is that you can make a conformal change of the metric so that uh, it starts to be complete. So indeed, in this example, it is not geodesically complete, but for all physical reasons, it is conformal to a space-time which is complete. And then the disappearing point, this point which was deleted, will not be reached at finite time, so to say, it will be reached at infinite time, so it will be geodesically complete for all relevant purposes. So there is a theorem of Giroch, which is actually an amazing result, that if you have a globally hyperbolic space-time, which I will denote by GH, globally hyperbolic, then your space-time has the following topology. It is something cross R. So if you are a topologist who uh, was reading some newspaper articles, you may sometimes encounter a question that the scientists are discussing that the shape of space is the Poincaré sphere. And of course, physically, it would not make any sense because uh, the shape of space-time is not a three-dimensional manifold, which Poincaré sphere is, it is a four-dimensional manifold. So implicitly what happens is that uh, people assume that your space-time is globally hyperbolic, so it satisfies conditions one and two of the Penrose strong constant censorship conjecture, and they're referring to the sigma as the shape of space. Each sigma cross T is the so-called Cauchy surface. Which doesn't help because you don't know the definition of a Cauchy surface. So sigma is Cauchy or Cauchy if the following is prohibited that you cannot leave the set and return back going along the causal trajectory. So this is not allowed. So in the Giroux theorem, each sigma cross T in the Cauchy surface is the Cauchy surface, so for each one of them, you cannot return back. So what would be the examples of Cauchy surfaces? So this is the Minkowski space time. One example of a Cauchy surface will be just this horizontal plane. But if you put up it slightly, you will get another Cauchy surface. So Cauchy surface is a stable condition. If you put up it slightly, you get another Cauchy surface and you will get another Giroux decomposition. Now let me immediately say one word, word of warning that in the Giroux theorem, this is a C0 equivalence. That every globally hyperbolic space time is homeomorphic to sigma cross R. But physicists did use this theorem in the C infinity category, so they were saying that it should be, of course, diffeomorphic to sigma cross R. And as topologists, we know that uh, this is different. There are plenty of, uh, plenty of objects which are homeomorphic to R4, but not diffeomorphic to the standard R4, and they're called exotic space times. But they were basically saved by a much later theorem of Antonio Bernal and Miguel Sanchez. And uh, this theorem indeed says that your space time is diffeomorphic to uh, sigma cross R, with each sigma cross T being Cauchy surface. Why is it relevant? Because here is the moment when uh, contact structures appear. Because assume that you have a light rate. So I have a green light ray. And it intersects the Cauchy surface, and I look at the velocity vector of the light ray. This velocity vector is not tangent to the Cauchy surface, but what you can do is that you can take its pink projection to the Cauchy surface. And you can show that the pink projection is non-zero. When I say projection, I mean with respect to the, uh, I mean the orthogonal complement of the velocity vector. You can show that. The orthogonal, the, the orthogonal complement is non-zero. Uh, so the orthogonal projection actually does make sense. 
So what it tells you is that first of all, you can introduce the space of all light rays. So space of unparametrized light rays. So what is a light ray? It is just a light geodesic. So it is a geodesic, and as I try to say that in every Lorentz manifold, geodesic still makes sense, but the velocity vector of it is light type, so the dot product of the velocity vector itself is zero. So what I observed is that I managed to associate to a light geodesic a non-zero vector tangent to the Cauchy surface. So why do I say unparametrized light geodesic? Because in the Riemann geometry, there is a so-called canonical parameterization of the light geodesic, or of the usual geodesic, which is going with speed one. But here the speed, so to say, is zero, because the dot product with itself is zero. So there is no canonical parameterization. And in principle, you can look at reparameterizations. And reparameterizations that would preserve the fact that it has to be a geodesic look as t goes to a t plus b. These are called affine reparameterizations. And if you choose another affine reparameterization of the light geodesic, the light vector gets rescaled and its projection to the Cauchy surface gets rescaled, but the direction does not change. And because of this, what happens is that we managed uh, to consider a map from the space of all light rays, which is movement with the speed of light by photons uh, to the spherical tangent bundle of any Cauchy surface. Okay, so spherical tangent bundle is the same as the tangent bundle, except that instead of the whole uh, tangent bundle, you do the following. You take the tangent bundle of the manifold, subtract the zero section, and make a quotient by the action of the group R plus, of positive real numbers, which act by rescaling. But now here is a very cool fact. Uh, Bernal Sanchez actually proved more. Metric to the tension bundle of the Cauchy surface is Riemann. And when you have a Riemann manifold, then of course you know that the tangent bundle starts to be the same as the cotangent bundle. And the spherical tangent bundle is the same then as the spherical cotangent bundle. So basically what happens is that the space of light rays can be identified with a spherical cotangent bundle of any Cauchy surface you want. And this is the remarkable observation of Robert Lowe. And Lowe somehow is a student. So Lowe, 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 Lowe is the person without whom all of this research would be impossible, uh, as well as without the result of Bernal and Sanchez, uh, because he observed that the space of light rays is the same as the spherical tangent bundle of a Cauchy surface, or which is the same as the spherical cotangent bundle of the Cauchy surface. And this guy has a natural contact structure. So what is a contact structure? So contact structure is an odd dimensional version of the symplectic structure. So it exists only on 2K plus one dimensional manifolds, only on manifolds of odd dimension. And contact structure uh, is the kernel of a certain one form and this one form has to uh, satisfy the condition that alpha wedge the alpha to the k is no way zero. So for the symplectic structure, the condition is that the wedge product of the symplectic structure with itself many, many times is non-zero. Okay, it is as close as it gets. 
and uh, it is maximally non-integrable. Which means that you cannot find manifolds of high dimension, which are everywhere tangent to the quantum structure. So the maximal tangent dimension, so maximal L small with uh, the uh, tangent bundle of L being in the kernel of alpha is K. So for example, if L plus one is three, then the maximal dimension of a manifold, which is everywhere tangent to the quantum structure is one. Is one. So you could talk about the so-called Legendre knots, right? And manifolds with this uh, property are called Legendre. So L, uh, L, L is Legendre. If first of all, it is everywhere tangent to the quantum structure. So the tangent bundle of L is in the kernel of alpha. And second of all, L is equal to K. So it is exactly as in this example, uh, L has to be one of the ambient quantum manifold is to K plus one dimensional. So in my example, assume that my quasi surface has dimension M. Then this guy has dimension to M minus one. And uh, it has a quantum structure. So the spherical tension bundle does not have a quantum structure naturally, but the spherical cotension bundle does. And there is a natural quantum form, which is basically the Liouville form. And what is the dimension of tangent manifolds? of the genre manifolds. So L in the spherical cotangent bundle is the genre. If uh, the following is true. So this guy is of dimension term minus one. So this would be the genre and if L is equal to M minus one. And now let me ask you a very strange question. Uh, how many light rays pass through a point in a space time? So how many light rays pass through a point in a space time? And on the first glance, everybody knows the answer. This is the so-called light cone. So it does have to be straight, of course, and it may have singularities because there is various types of curvature. Uh, the singularities usually are the cusp type, x squared equal to y cubed. This is for two plus one dimensional space times and in high dimensions, you will get swallow tails, which I will try to draw. <clears throat> but the important part is that, uh, strangely enough, there is a sphere of light rays passing through the point. So why is it not a cone? Because I would like to look at the light rays not as the part of the space times, but uh, as a part of the right light ray space. And uh, in the space of light rays, uh, there is exactly a sphere of light rays passing through a point. And guess what this phi is Legendre, right? I mean, that this phi is with dimension M minus one. So the space of light rays is, has dimension M to M minus one. 
So I can easily check that M minus one times two plus one is indeed two M minus one. And this here is the Jandrian. And it has a name, it is called the sky of a point. So how, why, how do you convince yourself that this sphere exists? So assume that I give you a laser point, or if you don't like laser points, so you can take a usual point and ask it to point it in all directions around you. So if you are sitting at the point, there is exactly a sphere of directions you can point it to, and this is the sphere of light rays through your point. So this is exactly the sky. Guess what, if you have two sphere, if you have two points, you have two spheres. So you, you have a Legendrian link, a couple of spheres. And basically what we proved is the following, that uh, theorem, This link is non trivial. Exactly if the points P and Q are causally related. And causally related means that you can reach from one point to another without violating the condition that you cannot exceed the speed of light. So basically what it means is that uh, if you know the link type of this Legendre and couple of spheres, then you can completely reconstruct causality. But the link type is completely determined by the intersection of the light cones with your Cauchy surface. So if you have the Cauchy surface, which basically is our universe today on May 28, 2021, then the light cones through two points, which are causally related, determines the link in the spherical cotangent bundle of the quartier surface, this link completely determines causality. But in order to reconstruct this link, you do not need to know the past. This is the strange part. You only need to know the intersection of the light rays uh, with the uh, quartier surface. So if you know where the light is visible from the two events at the current moment, then you know the link. And once again, these uh, circles, they do not have to be circles. They can be very singular manifolds. Uh, but nevertheless, this completely allows you uh, to reconstruct the link and hence causality. And actually you can do more. The, the link is not symmetric. The link consistent of uh, two spheres of light rays through the two points is not symmetric. because it is distinguished by the so-called positive Legendrian isotopy. So we, we proved that uh, if uh, Q is in the future of the point P, then there is a positive Legendrian isotopy from uh, the sky of Q to the sky of P, but not the other way around, right? So if Q is in the future of P, so P cos Q, then there is a positive Legendrian isotopy from the uh, sky of Q to the sky of P, but there is no positive Legendre is a from the sky of P to the sky of Q. So the link is not symmetric and you can completely figure out which of the events caused the other 
by looking at where the events are visible at the current moment. So uh, what was the conjectures that were stated before? So first of all, there was low conjecture. That was for two plus one dimensional space times. And what it says is that the topological link determines causality. So Law was smart. He tried, of course, to uh, investigate. And he is a student of Penrose, former student of Penrose. Uh, so of course, this uh, problem was motivated by the work of Penrose. Uh, and um, what Law tried to do is that he tried to see if the, uh, if the topological linking determines causality in the physically relevant dimensions. Uh, three plus one, right? Because we live in a three plus one dimensional space times, and this is what he wanted to do, but he immediately discovered counter examples. So he, he restricted his attention uh, to two plus one dimensional space times because there was hope. But what happened was that Lowe did know and he invented pretty much the uh, quantum extraction of the space of light rays, but at that time the Legendrian link theory was not developed. So it was not known that the Legendrian link theory is much richer than the topological link theory. And the results were mostly negative. So there was a classical result of Elashberg and Fraser saying that if you have a Legendrian knot which is topologically trivial, then it is Legendrianly trivial. And it was not clear if the Legendrian link theory is non-trivial, but then it was discovered that it is non-trivial. The first works were by uh, Eckholm, Etna, and Mike Sullivan. And uh, this was the conjecture uh, by two different people, by Natario and Todd, Hassan Natario and Paul Todd. We basically did the following. They said, okay, uh, what if instead of topological link, you put Legendre and link? Maybe this will save the day and maybe Legendre and link determines causality, but they were afraid of something. And this is why they assumed that the quasi surface, which they assumed to be three dimensional, has to be R3. And we solved all of these conjectures, but when there were still conjectures, there was also a question by Penrose uh, on the Arnold problem list, which asked to investigate uh, the uh, relation between causality and Lincoln. And of course, it was motivated by the conjectures of Lowe and of uh, Notario and Todd. And we completely answered all of these questions. So uh, the answer, which is our theorem with Nimirovsky, is uh, what, what I tried to say that I assume that the quasi surface is such that its universal cover is not compact. And I have one minute, right, or not? Sergei. Let me check. Yes, 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 I see. Let me check how my no, for, for you have four minutes. Yes. Four minutes. Okay. So assume that you have the universal covering, which is not compact. Uh, or, so it is not M, this is indeed O. So, if the universal cover is not compact, then Legendre and Lincoln determines causality. Or the universal cover is compact.
and the integer cohomology. is the same as an algebra as the one for a sphere CPN, HPN or Octavians. Then we have the link in determinant causality. And uh, since I have only two minutes, I will not be writing references. I will be uh, just saying that. So we also solved the low conjecture, which was the topological link. Um, and this uh, requires the works of Ding and Geiges. And in higher dimensions, uh, what happened in reality was that there is a classical theorem of bottom Samuelson, uh, which says that if your manifold has geodesics which are all closed of the same period, uh, then the universal cover is compact and it has very specific integer homology. But as we discovered with Stefan Nimirovsky, and this was our conjecture, which was proved by uh, Fraunfeld, Labrus, and Schlenk, that this actually is a quantum fact. That the bot samuelson theorem is not a theorem in, in Riemann geometry at all, it is a theorem in quantum geometry, and this allowed us to get the result I'm stating. And uh, this, this is it, and uh, as an advertisement, there is a Penrose uh, conference in mid-June, and uh, there I will try to discuss that the black hole uh, is actually also a Legendre link, which is strange, right? Because a black hole, uh, but it is a pre-component Legendre link. And this is hopefully a breakthrough observation of Stefan and myself that was done this year. And there I will also mention that uh, exotic smooth structures are not related to space times, because you can ask yourself if there is a reasonable space time which has exotic smooth structure in it and the answer is no. And this is it for today. Thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, please, any questions, comments, remarks, please. Uh, so, sorry, my question is uh, connected with uh, uh, time uh, translation. You you are saying about Lorentz uh, transformations, but uh, say about time as usually uh, Galilean. I was not talking about the Lorentz transformation. I was talking about reparameterization of a light ray. The only thing I was saying is that the geodesic equation. Uh, will not be satisfied if you choose the same curve, but you choose a different parameterization, it will not be zero. But if you do a very specific parameterization of the light geodesic that C goes to AT plus B, then the light geodesic goes to a light geodesic. This is called a fine reparameterization. This is not the same as Lorentz transformation. If this answers your question. Okay, thank you. Sorry, please. please. Your opinion about uh, uh, Hronon uh, due to uh, this term, uh, you can await uh, the uh, singularity uh, also in black holes. Do you know about this? No, about black, black, black holes are not globally hyperbolic. So, you, in order to get the global due to, due, due to repulsing, uh, um, quantum repulsing. No, no, it is not a quantum effect at all. Uh, black holes are not, not globally hyperbolic because, uh, I mean, pure black hole, because you have time travel. There is a rain inside of a pure black hole and there are unavoidable time travel machines around it. So it is not globally hyperbolic and the pure black holes have to be deleted. 
Thanks. Is this ask questions? Okay, okay, if no questions, so let us send the speaker again. Thank you very much, Paladis. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, everyone, and thank you very much, Sergey, and it was a pleasure to see you again.